My name is Johanna Wagstaff. I'm a meteorologist and an earth scientist. Every day, I see the effects of climate change through my work, a relentless cycle of extreme weather, terrifying storms, deadly heat domes, wildfires, droughts. But I remain in awe of the natural world and how it finds ways to adapt. And that's what we explore on Planet Wonder. Hello? Did you say something? Can you speak a little louder? Are you saying you're thirsty? Is this the sound of trees talking to each other? Probably not. But you've probably heard something somewhere about the fact that trees can communicate. And you've probably also heard that global warming is messing everything up. So that got me wondering, what are trees saying to each other about climate change? Trees play a major role in how carbon moves around planet Earth. You knew this was going to start with photosynthesis, right? The leaves from growing trees pull in CO2 from the atmosphere, the same CO2 we breathe out, and yes, the same CO2 released from burning fossil fuels. Add light and water, and then leaves turn this three-ingredient recipe into sugars used by the trees to grow. The waste product of this chemical reaction, oxygen, is re-released back to the atmosphere. Carbon remains locked inside the tree. Actually, scratch that. Carbon is the tree. The trunk, branches, leaves, and roots are all made up of tiny blocks of carbon. So when you look up at a giant Douglas fir, you are looking at a tower of carbon. CO2 is what gives it mass. How is your mind not blown yet? When a tree dies, it feeds most of that carbon back into the soil as it decomposes, which helps other trees. So for millions of years, trees have been doing a great job of pulling out excess CO2 in our atmosphere. Where the trouble began is when humans started producing too much carbon for the trees to take in. Add to that, a warming climate means more intense wildfires, droughts, pests, basically things that can kill trees. What are they saying to each other about this? So we met up with world-renowned Canadian tree scientist, Suzanne Samard. She has spent decades revolutionizing the way we understand how trees talk to each other. And I have been so excited to get to talk to her. First of all, welcome to my favorite forest. Well, thanks. This is beautiful. It's, it's a good one, right? Yeah. <laughs> how are trees talking to each other? Can you show us? Yeah, so they talk to each other through their root systems. Um, and these trees, they form a relationship with a fungus called a mycorrhiza fungus. So mycorrhiza literally means fungus root. And these fungi, which colonize the roots of the trees, which we can look at, actually will connect the trees together. So you can see there's a root coming off of this tree here, um, and it will go quite far. Like, um, so you can kind of see the angle, and that's how you know. It's coming yeah, it's going to come out this way, and then it... You know, it, it explores the soil in this very networked kind of pattern. And these roots can actually go, you know, as far as the tree is tall. So they're huge. But they fan out into these very fine root tips. And those root tips then become colonized by these mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so we can look. Okay. There's some, there's some roots right there. These are the fine roots. Oh, yeah. And they end in these little uh, root tips. And these root tips are where the fungus uh, colonizes and, and, and infects the root. It's like an, it is an infection, um, but, but it's a good infection. Right. <laughs> yeah, in that the, the fungus will get the photosynthate from the tree um, and, it, and it gets transmitted into these root tips and then that gets transmitted into the fungus itself. And the fungus returns for it um, nutrients and water that it pulls up from the soil. I see. So the tree is basically sending information to the fungus at the end of the roots, telling it what it what it needs, yes. and what it's lacking, and then the fungi helps bring out that moisture in places that the roots couldn't reach. So trees are talking to each other through mushrooms. Basically, yeah. <laughs> are your hands ever not dirty? No, my hands are always dirty. <laughs> and I've I've heard you describe it down here as sort of the internet. Yeah, which, it's like the internet. That's yeah. a really good way to think about it. Let's go down the rabbit hole. Trees are talking to each other below ground and through mushrooms. 
But get this, trees are also sending out electrical signals through leaves. And one biologist and musician found an artful way to listen in on that conversation. I'm obsessed. As modern biology, I'm fascinated with the sound of the present moment. I'm really interested in listening to elements of the environment, everything from changes in electromagnetic radiation to sunlight to wind to plant and fungal bioelectric changes. I feel like this moment is so alive and sometimes we don't realize it, we sort of forget. Essentially, when I'm working with plant or fungal bioelectricity, what I'm doing is using devices to run a very small current through whatever organism it is. And as the impedance changes over time, which is kind of a surrogate for bioelectrical changes, so signaling changes within the organism, no changes on a synthesizer change. And we can listen to those note changes as music. What we're listening to is not just random reactive cellular processes. It's actually the nervous system of a plant or a fungi. Plants, including trees, have phytonervous systems. So they don't have the same elements necessarily as a human nervous system, but they're using the language of electricity and action potentials to signal behavioral changes. I find what emerges is a real collaboration between natural bioelectricity or wind or, you know, waves or um, sunlight and myself. If we think about all of the problems that Mother Nature is facing right now, it can become overwhelming. But in the present moment, we always have a choice. And in the present moment, there's power. In the present moment, there's also hope, which is really, really important um, when you're trying to make a change. Suzanne, you have you know, grown up in the forests of BC. You started your career in the logging industry, decades of forest research. But what was your first clue that the trees were talking to each other? Yeah, I was really worried in the 1980s about how we were trying to get rid of our native plants. Yeah. So to grow faster conifers. In fact, we were spraying them with herbicides. And so I wanted to understand the role of those plants because I was worried that we were throwing away important parts of the ecosystem. And so birch was one of the ones that I was worried about. And so I started growing Douglas fir with paper birch and by itself. And when I grew Douglas fir with paper birch in the forest and I pulled up the roots, they were covered in an amazing array of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, many species and it turns out that a lot of those species link together directly with the birch tree so the birch and the fir were actually connected but when i grew douglas fir by itself without its lovely birch neighbors yeah. its roots were had very little fungi on them and so what was happening is that the birch was connecting with the fir and transmitting some of its sugars to the douglas fir and um which was super interesting because you know, we were getting rid of birch because it shaded the Douglas fir. And I found it that the more paper birch shaded Douglas fir, the more sugars it sent to Douglas fir, which was completely the opposite of what we were thinking, right? We were thinking that birch was competing mm -hmm. for sunlight with Doug fir, but it was actually sharing its riches, its carbohydrates, its sugars with the fir. So that was one of your light bulb moments. That was a big light bulb moment for me. Yeah, I thought, you know, we're, we've got this all wrong. We, here we are, we're, we're trying to basically reduce this ecosystem to just tree, to conifers, so that we can make more money from them. And we didn't understand that all these plants, including paper birch, were essential in bringing that forest up, in the growth and diversity of that forest. Hold that thought. That was the light bulb moment for Suzanne when she realized that trees are talking to each other. For Indigenous knowledge keepers, this idea of everything being connected is how they've understood the natural world for thousands of years. The trees in the forest, when they're connected below ground, uh, Subie, Bruce Miller, the late Bruce Miller, used to talk about how this would teach us about our own communities and that we could emulate what the trees teach us. Can you talk a little bit more about how knowing that everything is connected is, is directly tied to being caretakers. 
the reason that children are taught at an early age about these connections and the stories and, of course, good behavior and, and making sure that these connections remain intact to protect the cycles of life. For example, when we have the habitat that salmon need by making sure that things are connected in the forest, making sure that the, the hydrology is flowing the way that it should. Forests were managed to maintain supplies of large trees. And there were actually these scenarios in some areas where trees were harvested for planks of wood, but the tree was left standing and left alive. And so that later uh, more planks could be harvested. There were also trees that were completely cut down, used as house posts for frames. And, and of course, there were trees cut down for planks as well. But maintaining the large trees for canoe building and totem pole was a significant interest in protecting areas of the forest. And I think it's helpful if we start thinking about ourselves as a part of the forest. That's the way indigenous people view the forest in, in many ways. We are a part of this system. And when we take ownership in that sense, instead of the material ownership, then we are more inclined to provide the stewardship that's necessary and, and maintaining those connections of things in these environments so that they can continue to thrive. But what if that involves some tough love, a hunk of hunk of burn in love, when we come back? You know what's cool? Our tree scientist, Suzanne Samard, got a shout out from Coach Beard on Ted Lasso. Check this out. You know, we used to believe that trees competed with each other for light. Suzanne Samard's field work challenged that perception and we now realize that the forest is a socialist community. Trees work in harmony to share the sunlight. Also, Coach Beard just kind of nails what her work is all about. Pretty cool. So Suzanne, we know trees are talking to each other. But how did you learn that trees are also social creatures? Well, we actually mapped what that mycelial network looked like, the mycorrhizal network, um, by tracing the network using genetic tools in a forest from tree to tree. So we traced the fungal connections um, you know, that linked different trees together. And what emerged from that map of the forest, we, if you imagine looking down on a map and you see the trees, is that the trees that were the most highly connected were the biggest trees in the forest. This is what you call the mother trees. And they're, yeah, they're, we call them mother trees. So this one here, it's, it's the, one of the biggest trees around here. So the reason it's the most highly connected is because it has a crown or its top emerges out of, out of the top of the crown and it's very photosynthetic. And the other thing that we know from research with my graduate students is that, that these old trees can also recognize which seedlings around them are their own kin. They know which ones are their own offspring come from their own seeds. And they actually change their root morphology, their mycorrhizal networks. Um, they change the, the nutrients that are flowing through the network and to favor those wow. kin seedlings. So that's called kin selection. They are like mothers of the forest. Yeah, I, I can relate. All, all moms are basically the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Hold up. So what does the latest research reveal about how the lungs of our planet are doing in a warming world? Well, let's start with the world's largest rainforest, the Amazon. With an estimated 390 billion individual trees, the Amazon absorbs a quarter of all the CO2 on land. The amount absorbed today though, is about 30% less than it was in the 90s because of deforestation. And that's an important distinction to make, the difference between climate change and changes in land use. When the Amazon trees are burned or processed, the locked in CO2 is released back into the atmosphere. The latest research shows us that at the current rate of deforestation, the Amazon forest will no longer be able to regenerate by the end of the century. And what about the lungs in our own backyards and cities? Well, we may need to start thinking about planting different kinds of trees now that can tolerate the warmer, drier climates of our future. 
A new study in Nature Climate Change found that by 2050, about three quarters of the species that you see in and around your communities might not make it. And you only have to look to the forests of British Columbia, the heat dome of 2019, a drought in 2022, to see the long-term impacts of a changed climate. Many stressed trees are likely to die. Trees are resilient. And even though one tree can't just uproot itself and head on north, that is actually happening in a way. In the high Arctic, there are no trees. The tree line is what we call the edge of the habitat at which trees are capable of growing. Further north, and trees can't tolerate the extreme cold, snow, and lack of available moisture. Right at the tree line, the trees look sparse, stunted, and deformed by the wind and cold. The Arctic is warming more than four times faster than the rest of the planet. Tree seeds are surviving and growing further north. As trees cover a larger area of the Arctic, they're changing the color from barren white to a dark green that actually absorbs more heat, accelerating the warming process. Still, for me, the survival instinct of those trees is a poignant sign. What are trees saying to each other about climate change? Well, we know around the world that forests are stressed from climate change. Um, we see it in forest diebacks, we see it in inf insect infestations, we see it in just drought affected forests. Like this one. Yeah, like here in Vancouver, which is in a rainforest, when we dug down into the soil, it was dry. Um, and, you know, even in parks like Sani Park, you can see that the crowns are starting to um, lose their needles. There's some other insects that are coming in and kind of like a downward spiral for the tree. Like once it gets drought stricken, then it's easier for it to get infected by other things and it can send it down into a spiral. Um, so when trees get stressed like that, they actually communicate their stress levels to each other. And we found that when we drought stress one of the seedlings or infect it with a pathogen, that it will send signals through its mycorrhizal networks to the neighboring trees. Um, and those trees detect those signals and they upregulate their own defense machinery. They increase their defense enzyme production and they try to defend themselves against what that stressor was. Another thing that we're trying in our experiments is we're actually migrating genotypes from warmer climates or more southerly climates northward or to cooler climates. And, and that's called assisted migration and that's happening more and more in our forests. Um, so assisted migration is a real thing that's happening at a, at a big landscape scale. Um, you know, generally about 10% of of a seedlings that may be planted could be from migrated mm. genotypes. And what we're finding in, in our mother tree experiments is that when you leave, when you protect the old trees, that the new mig migrants have a better chance. Interesting. Trees are clearly stressed out by climate change. Take forest fires, for example. We're already seeing longer, hotter, drier fire seasons and more intense wildfires. And that means more carbon is being released into the atmosphere. But sometimes you have to burn trees to save trees. Talk to me, Robert Gray. Show me your laboratory. Good morning. I'm Bob Gray, and we're doing fire science. In fact, we're doing prescribed burning with fire effects monitoring. One of our objectives with prescribed fire is certainly uh, trying to kill some trees, typically small trees that are starting to grow uh, in the understory. And uh, if we have too many of those trees, when there is a fire, then what can happen is uh, those trees torch and they spread fire from the surface into the overstory tree. If we don't do the burning, then we're going to have wildfire. As you can see, we haven't killed all the small trees. After a certain height, we just can't kill trees very easily with spring prescribed burning. It's okay because we need these small trees to start to fill in some of these gaps. Any of the trees that were killed in the fire, we use the term top kill, which means that the stem that's above the ground is girdled by the fire and that releases a hormone. And then the roots will produce thousands and thousands of suckers. So where there used to be a dozen trees here this year, by next year, there could be about 50,000 trees. I think we're burning between seven and 10,000 hectares a year. And we should be burning on the order of 100,000 to maybe 200,000 hectares a year. So we're, we're falling way short of that and our ecosystems need it. What better way to talk about tree planting than in the chaotic uh, dog walking zone? Uh, you've done several shows on this. 
Yep, I have. Johanna, are you coming back? Suzanne, how hopeful are you that our, our trees are going to be able to adapt fast enough to our warming climate? You know, I'm, I'm really hopeful. I know based on our network mapping of forests that, that these networks are super connected and resilient. So they're resilient because these connections between trees are, are they're many, right? This tree is connected to this tree in many different levels, many different points of contact. And so if you lose some of the connections, those, there's still some left. So there are concrete things that we can change to make sure our forests are still intact and still our carbon sinks into the future and that, you know, and that they regenerate and, and continue to you know, breathe out oxygen and clean our air and provide us with beautiful places to come visit. I like my favorite forest. I know, it's amazing. Yeah. All of that had me wondering, what about just planting more trees to replenish what we've lost? Obviously, smaller trees are going to store as much carbon, but it's a starting place. So that's something I asked Laura Lynch, the host of What on Earth? I know we've been trying to get our dogs together forever, and I'm so happy to meet Mickey. <laughs> I'm really happy to meet Rodney, and they like each they other. They like each other. And what better way to talk about tree planting? Because I know you've done several shows on this topic. You know, the big question is, why can't we just plant our way out of this mess? Well, it was certainly an idea that the, the federal government, the, uh, the Justin Trudeau raised in the last election when it plant, promised to plant two billion trees, but it's just yeah, not it that, billion. it was not, it's just not that easy mm -hmm. because you just can't plant wherever you want to plant. And climate change means the best places to plant are actually changing across the country. Right. And in, uh, uh, experiments in Ontario have shown us that if you want to plant on private land, you have to have the private landowners agree to it and not all of them may be that interested in doing it. So it's much more complicated. So we're behind on our commitments already. We are behind on the commitment that the federal government ra ra made to plant plant two billion trees in a decade. It's, it's an attractive option for uh, government to make because it's easier than doing fossil fuel reduction to cut emissions. Well, there are people trying. And if you haven't heard of this guy, your kid probably has. He has over 100 million YouTube subscribers. Mr. Beast, yes, I'm about to quote Mr. Beast, acknowledge that it will take years before these new trees can make a considerable impact. And honestly, I've done everything I can. I got a bunch of fans together and we planted thousands of trees and I'm personally planting 100,000 trees, AKA $100,000 donation. But at the end of the day, 20 million more trees is better than none. And doing nothing is how we got here. What can one person do in one community, in one neighborhood, in one city? What can we do to help? Vancouverites are landscaping with increased heat in mind. And it's sort of designated as a, a place that it will always be a lot cooler than, than out there, which gets more light and more sun. In Winnipeg, the city is planning to replace trees lost in storms with new ones. In Canada's largest city, Toronto, pop-up grottos full of all kinds of plants will provide shade and improve air quality. Asphalt is hot. Uh, concrete is hot. When you add more green, it uh, absorbs toxins and it gives off more oxygen and we all need that. Suzanne Samard says that trees in the city are also talking to each other. Beneath the concrete, the internet continues. So, what are trees saying to each other about climate change? They're warning each other, they're taking steps themselves to survive, and they're finding ways to adapt with our help. And to quote my old pal Socrates, wonder is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, we can't, we can't leave without you telling me how and why we're going to eat dirt. Because my three and a half year old wants to know. So one of the cool ways that we can tell the difference between organic material from the mineral soil, we want to know, you know, if we're dealing with one or the other, because most of the mycorrhizal network is, is in the organic material. Okay. I love dirt. Okay. So I put some in my mouth. And yeah. Can you hear it crunching? Yes. Okay, now I know it's mineral. Does it taste good? <laughs> so good. Uh, like the gritty stuff? Yeah, it's really Should good. Should I try some? Try it, yeah. It's really nice. It's really good for your bowels too. 
<laughs> we'll get that off. We'll get that off camera. <laughs> Actually, it's not bad. It's not bad. We're trying to get dirt that tastes like chocolate, and Suzanne told me you got to get down below the surface into the humid. Like here. Let's cheers first. <laughs> It's not good? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't taste like chocolate.